Hey. We start a new class, uh, two, maybe three weeks, I'm not sure how long. Uh, I taught this class 11 years ago, so I figured it was time you needed to hear it again. But uh, it's the story of the English Bible, and I think it's fair to say that we take the English Bible for granted. I mean, all our lives, we've had the Bible available in English at a cheap price and in multiple versions. I own many English translations of the Bible, both in printed and electronic form, and I have access to additional English translations through the internet. And you probably have multiple translations of the Bible in your home and on your various devices, phone and tablet and all that. But such a thing wasn't always possible. You know, we've just, it's just been part of our lives. But that wasn't always possible. The story of how the Bible came to be translated into English is really a story of faith and courage and dedication and brutality. And I think that English-speaking Christians should know something about it. So in this class, I'm going to sketch that story for you, this class and one or two others. I'm going to sketch that story. Now, the books of the Old Testament, as you know, those books were written in Hebrew with some Aramaic. And you can see Aramaic is in Ezra 4, 8 to 6, 18, uh, Ezra 7, 12 to 26, this lengthy section, Daniel 2, 4 to 7, 28, Jeremiah 10, 11, and there are two words in Genesis 31, 48 that are in Aramaic. But mainly the Old Testament is in Hebrew. And then, of course, the Greek, uh, the New Testament is in Greek, Koine Greek, common Greek. And by the time of his death in 323 B.C., okay, before Christ, by the time of his death in 323 B.C., Alexander the Great had established a vast Grecian empire around the Mediterranean Sea and eastward. And this led to Greek becoming what is known as the lingua franca, the umbrella or common language through which people of different languages could communicate. So you had people who spoke all kinds of language, but Greek then, through that conquest, became the common language. And during that time, most Jews, as is true today, most Jews lived outside of Israel, and they no longer spoke Hebrew because they had moved away into other cultures and places, and in generations or two or three then they no longer spoke Hebrew. So they needed a translation of their scriptures. These Jews in the diaspora who lived outside of Israel, who no longer spoke Hebrew, they needed a translation that they could understand. And Greek was the obvious choice after the conquest by Alexander the Great because it was the language that most people, including most Jews, spoke. So they needed a translation of their scriptures because they no longer spoke Hebrew, and the choice of Greek was a no-brainer because that was the common language of the time. Now, the Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they were translated into Greek in the middle of the third century B.C., so around 250 B.C., and the other books of the Old Testament, they were translated into Greek in the next century or two. So in the middle of the third century, this process begins around 250, then another century or two, you have the other uh, Hebrew writings of Scripture translated into Greek. And these early Greek translations of the Hebrew Scriptures, those Greek translations are known collectively as the Septuagint. And it's that Septuagint, that phrase, word, is commonly represented by that Roman numeral 70, LXX. So if you see that, that represents the Septuagint, 
which is this, these uh, Greek renderings of the Hebrew Scriptures. And it's at 70 because of a, a story about how the, the uh, Pentateuch was translated by 70 people. Okay, so that's how that came to be the representation of the Septuagint. And in the first few centuries A.D., in the first few centuries A.D., so from Jesus' time, first century, second century, third century, these Greek translations of the Old Testament, this Septuagint, and the Greek New Testament, they were translated into various languages. Okay, so we've got Hebrew and Aramaic Old Testament. It gets translated into Greek. New Testament is in Greek. And then you have in the first few centuries, you have people taking the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and the Greek New Testament, translating those into various languages, including Latin. And Latin became the dominant language of the Western, uh, of the Western uh, world, a Western Christianity. And these early translations into Latin, they are called or known as Old Latin versions. Okay, so we have Old Latin, you get these early Latin translations of the Septuagint and the New Testament. And then in the late 4th century, so late 300s, in the late 4th century A.D., a great scholar named Eusebius Hieronymus, better known as Jerome. So this scholar, he translated the entire Bible into Latin directly from the Hebrew and Aramaic of the Old Testament scriptures and Greek. And over the next couple of centuries, so he's in the late 300s, he does this, and over the next couple of centuries, Jerome's translation of the Hebrew and Aramaic and the Greek into Latin, that became the Latin Bible. It swept the field. So you had these old Latin versions, but when Jerome did his, it became the Duke. Okay, it swept, it swept the field. His translation is known as the Vulgate, which means common. So it's, it's known as the Vulgate, and it became the official Latin version of the Roman Catholic Church. It included the Apocrypha. These books you have here, the traditional Apocrypha, 1st and 2nd Ezra, down through the Oxford Annotated Apocrypha includes 3rd and 4th Maccabees and Psalm 151. So Jerome's Vulgate included the Apocrypha, but Jerome thought that those books were different, distinct from authoritative scripture because those books were not part of the Hebrew canon. In other words, those books were not part of what ancient Jews understood to be Scripture. So though he translates them there, he himself viewed these as distinct from Scripture. And then here is the oldest uh, codex of the complete Vulgate. Now this is an old book, people. This book's from about 700 and it is the oldest, it, it's the uh, Codex Amiatinus from about 700. It's the complete Vulgate. And there, I just wanted to show you a picture of that. Now, with the collapse of the Roman Empire in the 5th century, with the collapse of the Roman Empire, the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes invaded England from Germany and Denmark, and the language of these invaders who came and took over England, that formed the basis of what is known as Old English or Anglo-Saxon. And over the course of two centuries, so the Roman Empire falls in the fifth century, after that you have the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes from Germany and Denmark coming in to England, and then their language forms the basis of Anglo-Saxon. And over the course of two centuries, beginning at the end of the sixth century, so in the late 500s, beginning then over the next two centuries, England converts to Christianity, and so there was a demand for uh, scriptures in this emerging language of Anglo-Saxon. 
this emerging language of Old English because the Latin was no longer useful to them because now we have Anglo-Saxon. So there's this demand for scriptures in uh, Old English. And the first a reported translation of a biblical text into Old English was Aldhelm's translation of the Psalms, which work he began around A.D. 700. And that work hasn't survived. There are many works like this in history. We know about them, but we don't have them. And the same is true of the work by the Venerable Beatty, who was a great scholar of his day, he translated the Gospel of John several decades after the work of Aldhelm, but that work hasn't survived. We simply know about that work from other people mentioning it. And in the ninth century, King Alfred the Great, he had the Ten Commandments, portions of Exodus chapter 21, verse 23, and Acts chapter 15, verses 23 to 29, he had that put into Old English at the head of his code of law. So he has the statutes and he has translated the Ten Commandments in these sections of Exodus and Acts. He has those put at the head of his code of laws. So that's where we are in the translations being put into Old English. But in the mid-10th century, a man named Aldred, not to be confused with Old Helm, but Aldred, he added an Anglo-Saxon interlinear to an 8th century manuscript in Latin. So he's got an 8th century manuscript in Latin of Gospels, and he's not translating it, but what he's doing, if you're familiar with an interlinear, like if you have a Greek interlinear, it has the Greek there, and then under it, it puts just literal meanings of words. Well, that's what this person did with this, this uh, manuscript of Latin, he then goes, and in, in this English, he goes and writes in the middle of the 10th century here in this, in this early English, and he puts the literal rendering of certain Latin words he puts in Old English. And you can see, you can just see the little handwritten script, right, in between the Latin uh, printing. And so that's, that's what w was done there in the uh, Aldred. And, and this is known as the Lindisfarne Gospels. And so middle of the 10th century, so around 950. And then you get something very similar to this in the late 10th century. With Farman and Owen, they did the same with what is known as the Rushworth Gospels. Okay, so it's not a translation. It's taking a Latin manuscript and going in and doing interlinear renderings right above those words. And here you see that uh, and from the late 10th century. And this is an image from Luke chapter 23. Now, in the late 10th century, so the late 900s, late 10th century, the Gospels were translated. They were translated from Latin into Old English, particularly into a, what's known as a West Saxon dialect of Old English. So as opposed to an interlinear gloss, you actually get a translation from the Latin into Old English. And this work is known as the Wessex Gospels. And I did this, I highlighted this here just to let you see how difficult this is. You and I can't read this. Right? This is, quote, Old English. But you take a look. I highlighted a parallel. You see, this is Luke, or Luke 23, verse 34, where I've given you the highlight. And then you have a, a, a printing of what's being said there, or the wording, the lettering, represented here on the right. And look at it. I mean, I, Park would say, Highland Father, forgive whom? <laughs> Something like that, you know, somebody who knew that language. I'm looking at that going, that's pretty wild. But you see it, so that, that's from, there you have that in, uh, in Old English. So just to recap the Old English, You've got Aldhelm does the Psalms around 700, the Venerable Bede, the Gospel of John in the early 8th century. King Alfred the Great puts these portions at the head of his laws, the Lindisfarne Gospels and the Rushworth Gospels, which are really interlinear renderings. And then you get this translation of the Wessex Gospels from the Latin into Old English. Now in 1066... Right, the Normans, 
They were Vikings who had settled around Normandy, France, along with some native French people. They conquered England, uh, mainly in the key battle being the Battle of Hastings in 1066. And this is known as the Norman Conquest. And it marked the end of the Old English or the Anglo-Saxon period. This marks the end of that because the French aristocracy that ruled England after the Norman Conquest, they repressed Anglo-Saxon. They didn't like it. They repressed Anglo-Saxon and they declared Norman French to be the official language of England. And you can, as you can imagine, this radically transformed Old English because Anglo-Saxon Old English is being repressed. They're promoting this and saying the official language of England is Norman French. And you can see how that will play out in a radical transformation of the, of the language that the people spoke there. So it transformed Old English into what is known as Middle English. Okay, so the earlier work that I just went through that had been done on Anglo-Saxon versions, like the Wessex Gospels, that became obsolete because the transformation of the language was so significant that that really wasn't functional for people. And so in Middle English, in the, in the late 12th century, there was a monk named Orm, and he provided a poetic rendering of certain texts in the Gospels and Acts. These texts that, had, that were used in the Roman Catholic Mass throughout the year. So he took those texts that were used in the, in the Mass and he gave a poetic rendering of those sections of Gospels and Acts. And here you can see a copy of the manuscript, the Ormulum, and you can see work continued on it with corrections by later editors and this kind of thing. And over the next century or so, so this is the late 12th century, the late 1100s. And over the next century or so, loose poetical versions of several Old Testament books appeared. Now, in the 14th century, I keep telling you this because it's easy to get confused when I say 14th century, you think 14th, no, 1300s, okay? In the 14th century, both William of Shoreham and a man named Richard Roll, they produced very literal translations, very literal renderings uh, from Latin into Middle English. And here's a picture of, of the uh, book, the Codex Richard Roll Psalms from the late 14th century. Now, the work of John Wycliffe, the work of Wycliffe, and you can see his name is variously spelled, right? I went with W-Y-C-L-I-F-F-E. It's sometimes spelled W-Y-C-L-I-F, W-Y-C-L-I-F-F, W-I-C-L-I-F. Right, you see how it's... So there are variations of how to spell his name. But Wycliffe, his work in the latter part of the 14th century was a major turning point in the history of the English Bible. The work of John Wycliffe. Now, Wycliffe... He lived from 1324 to 1384. And he is called the morning star of the Protestant Reformation for good reason. He was an Oxford-trained theologian. And I'm reminded of the remarks of a professor of mine. He said, God can use an educated man as well as an ignoramus. And I sometimes feel like we have an aversion to scholarship and things, and I don't think it's healthy. But anyway, this guy God used. He's an Oxford-trained theologian who took issue with the Catholic Church's teaching on a number of points, including its civil authority, pilgrimages, praying to the saints, the sale of indulgences, you know, where they would say, here, you give me this much money, give me this much money, and we'll spring your relative out of purgatory. Uh, you know, just give us enough, and we'll take care of that for you. And also, he took issue with the doctrine of transubstantiation, the notion that through the, uh, what the priest says, that the, that the bread, 
of the Lord's Supper is literally transformed into the body of Christ. So Wycliffe took issue with these things, and after his teaching was declared heretical by a Catholic council in 1382, Wycliffe then retired to Lutterworth in England, where he continued to write. Now, Wycliffe was uh, crazy enough. He was crazy enough to believe that each person was responsible directly to God, which meant they were responsible for obeying what God had revealed in the Scriptures rather than the man-made rules, the man-made accretions that had been piled onto Scripture. And for that reason, you see, he believed that God's Word needed to be in the language of the common man because he said, you are responsible before God. So he was convinced that the Word needed to be in the language of the common man. I mean, at that time, Scripture was essentially unavailable to the layman, to an ordinary person. You simply could not get the Scriptures because the complete Bible was available only in Latin. And you didn't speak Latin. You didn't understand Latin. The only people who knew Latin were the highly educated people who had been trained in Latin. And so it was only available in Latin, which didn't do you any good, and the copies were far too expensive for anyone to afford. I mean, you can imagine if I ask you, if I commissioned you, write the entire Bible for me by hand. And you sat down with Jenna. Now, how much would you charge me for that? It's going to take you a while. <laughs> right? And when you finish all the time you put in that, you say, hey, I'm not letting you have this for two bucks. All right? So that's what they, so the, the, they didn't have access to scriptures. Wycliffe wrote at one point, he said, those heretics who pretend that the laity need not know God's law, but that the knowledge which priests have had imparted to them by word of mouth is sufficient, do not deserve to be listened to. For holy scriptures is the faith of the church, and the more widely its true meaning becomes known, the better it will be. Therefore, since the laity should know the faith, it should be taught in whatever language is most easily comprehended. Christ and his apostles taught the people in the language best known to them. And so this is how Wycliffe looked at things. Now he oversaw and probably participated in the translation of the complete Bible into English. Okay, this is the first translation of the complete Bible into English. And the first edition of the Wycliffe Bible, it is called the Wycliffe version or the early version. That first edition came out of the complete Bible in English in 1382. This early Wycliffe version. Now that edition was a stilted, extremely literal translation from the Vulgate, from the Latin Bible. So he didn't go to the original text. He went from the Latin, be like if you picked up an NIV or an ESV or something and then translated that into German or something like that. That's what he did. But it was very stilted and very literal. And here is a page you can see. And again, I've highlighted. And here's the beginning of the Gospel of John from here in this, in Wycliffe's version, here in this Middle English, where you see, and you see how the words, the, even the, the lettering is just difficult for you to make out, right? I mean, you see, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was at God, and the Word, and God was the Word. But you can see, you're trying to figure out the lettering here, because the, the letters just are shaped differently for the sounds. P's and F's, what, what looks to us like an F isn't. Okay, so it's, it's not as easy. But there you have a Wycliffe's thing. Then the second edition. So he finishes this in 1382. This stilted, uh, literal rendering. But then the second edition of the Wycliffe Bible, called Purvey's 
revision, P-U-R-V-E-Y apostrophe S, Purvey's revision. That was, or it's also called the later version of the Wycliffe Bible. That was a revision that was perhaps done by Wycliffe's friend and associate scholar, a man named John Purvey. Well, that revision of the Wycliffe Bible was completed between 1388 and 1395. And the reviser, whether it was Purvey or someone else, used a much smoother style of translation. Now, it wasn't so woodenly literal, so it was easier for people to read, right? Now, you know how that is even when you're just reading modern English versions. Some just seem easier and smoother to read. And so that's what was done with that. And it was popular. That version was popular, and it was very influential in the history of English translations, even if indirectly so. And just as a footnote, a copy of this later version, a copy of this version, the manuscript for this one was dated from the early 15th century. Okay, so the Purvey's revision is completed between 1388 and 1395. This manuscript from the early 1400s sold in December 2016 for one million six hundred and ninety two thousand and five hundred dollars. So if you have one of those in your attic, you better really take care to preserve it. Now the Roman Catholic Church did not take kindly to a translation that was used to popularize the reading of the Bible by laymen, the reading of the Bible by common people. The leaders of the church, they thought the Bible was too difficult for laymen to understand and that making it available to common folk, it would likely lead to heresy because they wouldn't understand what they're reading and they're going to get all kinds of crazy ideas. Now, a more cynical view of their opposition of translating the Bible into English is that the church's hold on the laity was to a significant degree based on its monopoly on the Word of God. Right now, if the people had a Bible they could read, they could then judge whether the teaching and the conduct of their religious leaders met that standard. Okay, so now if, if I have something I can see, I'm looking at what you're telling me and what you're doing. Okay, so the more cynical view is that mm, they didn't want that because that was key to their control. They were the only ones who had access to the Word of God, and you just trust me. You see, trust me what I'm saying. If you let people get out there and they can read and they go, hmm, I'm seeing this. What are you doing? So maybe that's what's driving, and I suspect so. Now, Wycliffe's followers, people who were sympathetic toward Wycliffe and his views, they were, as you might imagine, demonized. They were demonized. They were given the derogatory name Lollards, which meant mutterers. So they were given that name and they were persecuted. And copies of the translation of Wycliffe's translation were systematically seized and burned because it posed that great of a threat. Now the fact that 250 manuscripts of the Wycliffe Bible survive despite a systematic persecution and burning of them, despite how old they are, that's testimony to how popular that Bible was. Right? There were an awful lot of copies of this thing floating around. That's more manuscripts than there are for any other medieval English text. 250. For example, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which you may have been forced to read in high school, that survives only in 64 manuscripts. So the Wycliffe Bible, we've got 250 roughly. Now in 1401, okay, so you I keep the chronology, 1382, the Wycliffe Bible, the revision, 1388, 1395. 1401, the English Parliament, the British Parliament, they, they pass 
a statute that is called de heretico comberendo, which means regarding the burning of heretics. Okay, and as you might imagine, it prescribed death by burning for heretics. And then in 1408, the Oxford Council, which was called together by the Archbishop of Canterbury, who at that time was a man named Thomas Arundel, they formulated, this council at Oxford formulated the infamous constitutions that mentioned Wycliffe by name. He died in 1384. <laughs> this is in 1408. We got this constitution. They're still talking about Wycliffe. He drove them crazy. Right? So they mentioned Wycliffe by name and they forbid translating the Bible into a common tongue without express supervision by the church. So thereafter, translating the Bible into English or even reading the Bible in English were heretical acts. To translate it into English or to read it in English were heretical acts. And in 1411, this archbishop, Thomas Arundel, just to let you know how uh, irate they were at Wycliffe. So he's dead in 1384. This is 1411. And this is a letter that Arundel wrote to Pope John the 23rd. And he says, this pestilent and wretched John Wycliffe of cursed memory, that son of the old serpent, endeavored by doctrine of holy church, devising to fill up the measure of his malice, the expedient of a new translation of the scriptures into the mother tongue. How dare he? The audacity of this person to want everyday people to be able to look at the Bible. What a what just crazy man to do that. Evil, wicked. And that's what he says to Pope John the 23rd. Now, there were quite a few uh, Lollards who suffered, who were, who were uh, burned at the stake, who were martyrs. William, the Catholic priest, William Sawtree, he was burned at the stake in March of 1401 for his Lollard beliefs. In other words, for his uh, sympathy toward the, the perspective and understanding of Wycliffe. He was burned at the stake for that. And the Lawler, John Badby, who was, he was a lay craftsman. He wasn't a theologian or anything. He was a craftsman. But he thought Wycliffe was on to something. And he was burned at the stake in March of 1410 for refusing to recant his denial of the doctrine of transubstantiation. Now you think about that. This guy was so convinced that he had to stand for the truth of God that when they told him, we won't, won't burn you to death if you'll just simply renounce what you said to transubstantiation is untrue, he said, I can't do it. Oh, man. Well, he was burned to death. Now, in 1413, we have a, a socialite, Sir John Oldcastle, who was a former friend of King Henry V, he was convicted of heresy in 1413 because of his Lollard beliefs. So he gets convicted of heresy, but he escaped. He went on the, he was on the lamb. He was in hiding for a number of years, but he was found and he was hanged on December 14, 1417, and then his body and the gallows on which he was hanged together, they were burned. And it wasn't altogether clear whether he was burnt alive. So that happened to him. And then in 1415, the Council of Constance condemned Wycliffe 31 years after he's dead. They condemned this guy, and it also ordered that the Bohemian, meaning he was from Bohemia, which is the modern Czech Republic. So this Bohemian theologian, a man named Jan Hus, or John Hus, as his often, name is often given, who had been influenced by Wycliffe, well, they ordered him to be burned at the stake, and he was. He was. 
You know, pile up the fire, tie the guy to it, light it. There he goes. Now, in 1999, so this guy was burned to death in 1415. In 1999, Pope John Paul II issued a formal apology from the Catholic Church for Huss's, quote, cruel death, end quote, and he praised Huss's moral courage. Uh, that didn't help him much, but uh, better late than never. But numerous other Lollards, sympathizers with Wycliffe, were executed. But more than a few of them, including John Purvey, avoided that fate by recanting their beliefs. Okay, so there were people who said, you know, come to think of it, this is an issue isn't all that important to me. Unlike the guy who says, nope, transubstantiation is not true. I'm not going to say it's true. And he gets burned up. There are a lot of people who did recant to avoid that fate. Then in 1428, 44 years after his death on the order of Pope Martin V, Wycliffe's bones were dug up. They, were, they exhumed his body, dug up his bones, burned his bones, and then dumped his ashes in the River Swift. And here is a woodcut from Fox's 1563 Book of Martyrs depicting what's happening. You see the guy pouring the ashes? You see they're digging up his bones, they're burning them here, and then this guy's dumping the ashes in the river. Right? I mean, they really didn't like this guy. You know, they thought, oh man, this guy's turned demons loose on the world or something. And so they hated him. Now, the modern English, so that's Middle English. Okay, we went Anglo-Saxon, Old English. Now that's Middle English. And we come to the modern English period, which began around 1500 A.D. The modern English period. And it followed the invention of the printing press in the early 1450s, the printing press was invented by Johann Gutenberg in Mainz, Germany. And it's really hard to overstate the impact of that. This new technology revolutionized the world. This printing press, it made it possible that an, in, that an inexpensive Bible could be mass-produced, okay? Because I don't have to have an individual sitting here copying this Bible. Once I can have it laid out once, then I can, we can just pump these babies out, you see? And so it's a whole different ball game. After that printing press in the early 1450s, now the first major book that was printed on Gutenberg's press was the Latin Bible. And it was printed around 1455, and it's not surprisingly known as the Gutenberg Bible. There are only 47 copies of this Bible known to be in existence, none of which are for sale in case you had a few million you wanted to throw that way. But none of them are for sale. And here is a, here is a picture of that first Bible. And you see how ornate these things are. And they really are beautiful. Now, the period of printing from 1455, so the early 1450s, you get the printing press. You have the Gutenberg Bible printed around 1455. This early period of printing from 1455 to 1500, that period is known as the Incunabula period. Okay, meaning infant stage. So that very first 50 years, 45 or 50 years of the printing press's existence, it's known as the Incunabula period. And books that were printed during that early period are known collectively as the Incunabula and individually known as an Incunabulum, if the book was printed during that little window. Now, during this time... <coughs> The print type, the font, was designed to look like a handwriting font during that period. Now, despite the vast number of Wycliffe Bibles that were available, right? I mean, this was very popular 
book, there were all kinds, like I said, of 250 manuscripts still survive. But despite the vast number of Wycliffe Bibles that were available to be printed, you could have just taken the Wycliffe Bible, typed, set it, and then run them off. There, were the, the, there was no Bible printed in English during that incunabula period, that 45-year period. No Bible was printed in English. The controversy surrounding Wycliffe, how they had demonized this guy and just gone after this guy and said, you know how that works with political power. You got everybody so afraid they don't have anything to do with this guy. And so that's probably what's going on. This thread of heresy kept these printers, no doubt, they avoided that text. I don't want to be printing this Bible in, in English. I do that and it's going to be nothing but headaches if I don't wind up getting burned. So I simply don't want to do that. Now, in 1483, right, so this incunabula period, 1455 to 1500, in that window, in 1483, English translations of portions of Scripture were printed, but they were printed, you see, as part of the English translation of an earlier Latin work titled Golden Legend. And that earlier Latin work was a book about the lives of great men of faith. And in that earlier Latin book, Golden Legends, about the lives of great men of faith, there were some biblical texts that were referred to and cited. So when that book, it was translated into English, and that book was printed. Apparently, translating Scripture in that context, that kind of indirect, just picking it up as part of this old Latin book that wasn't really a Bible but simply mentioned some text, printing an English translation of Scriptures in that context apparently avoided the ire of the church. So that was allowed to slip by. Now, when the Christian center in Constantinople fell to the Muslim Turks, in 1453. You remember the the Roman Empire falls in the 5th century, but the eastern part of the empire, known as the Byzantine Empire, continued on for many centuries. But it diminished. It kept diminishing. And here you can see the empire about 1020 and then the empire about 1360. Okay, so it's diminishing in influence. I heard that bell. But Constantinople was a Christian center. And when it fell to the Muslim Turks, In 1453, it had a big impact because all of the scholars there who had great capacity and facility in the Greek language fled westward. And so it wasn't a brain drain, it was a brain fill-up. As they all came from Constantinople here and they're all going westward, and so that energized Greek studies and at the same time, knowledge about Hebrew in the West was increasing. So that's where we are, where we end the story. Pick back up next week, Lord willing. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to point here, Bernard. (laughs) Bernard asked me, you're going to be pointing up here?